It's really just an accident of history that the river we know today as the Mississippi carries that name for the length it does. From the river to the valley to the sea All the places, all the people that you can meet Welcome to the Mississippi Valley Traveler Podcast. I'm Dean Klinkenberg, and I've been exploring the deep history and rich culture of the people and places along America's greatest river, the Mississippi, since 2007. Join me as I go deep into the characters and places along the river, and occasionally wander into other stories from the Midwest and other rivers. Read the episode show notes and get more information on the Mississippi at MississippiValleyTraveler.com. Let's get going. Welcome to Episode 9 of the Mississippi Valley Traveler Podcast. Would the Mississippi sound just as sweet by any other name? That's the question in today's episode. I'll take you through a little bit of the history of how the river came to be called Mississippi, uh, some alternative names that came and went. Uh, The indigenous communities along the river had their own names for the Mississippi. We'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll talk about Big Muddy, Father of Waters, Old Man River, uh, a little bit about those nicknames. I'm going to throw in just for a little bit of fun, a a brief story on uh, the search for where the river we call Mississippi begins. A quick shout out to all the Patreon supporters. As always, thank you for your support. And now let's get on to the episode. I don't know if the kids still do this today, but when I was in grade school, uh, it took me a five-mile walk across a frozen lake in bare feet to get there. You couldn't be a spelling champion until you mastered the 11-letter word for the most famous river in North America. M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. That spelling test would have been a heck of a lot easier if attempts to name the river something else had succeeded. Many of the early Europeans who reached the Mississippi tried to give it a new name to shore up their own claims of discovery and ownership. Fernando de Soto might be the exception. While he and his band of marauders were probably the first Europeans to see the big river up close, de Soto apparently didn't christen the Mississippi. His scribe recorded the name Rio Grande for big river, but mapmakers influenced by early Spanish explorations usually labeled it Rio Escondido for Hidden River or Rio del Espiritu Santo for River of the Holy Spirit. None of those names stuck, though, probably because the Spanish didn't remain in the Mississippi Valley to enforce their name claims. A century later, Louis Joliet and Father Jacques Marquette explored the upper Mississippi. Both were already familiar with the name Mississippi, but Marquette thought the river should be called Immaculate Conception. His name didn't gain traction either. Meanwhile, Louis Joliet wanted to name it in honor of Louis de Bois, the governor of New Canada who commissioned the trip. But Riviere de Bois didn't find any favor beyond Joliet. La Salle referred to the river as both Mississippi and Colbert. For Jean-Baptiste Colbert, the popular 17th century minister of finances under King Louis XIV, Father Louis Hennepin, the dour missionary sent by La Salle to explore the Upper Mississippi, went for a name, went on a naming binge, even after some Dakota Indians held him hostage for a few weeks. While St. Anthony stuck as the name for the falls at present-day Minneapolis, Lake Pepin today isn't known as the Lake of Tears, thank goodness, nor did his repetition of Colbert stick to the Mississippi. Some 18th century maps labeled the lower part of the River St. Louis, apparently just after the death of King Louis XIV. That name for the river didn't have staying power either. French voyagers and Catholic missionaries heard the name Mississippi quite early. The first European to write down the name of the big river was probably Father Claude Jean Alouez in 1667, a missionary spreading the Christian gospel to American Indians along the Fox River in central Wisconsin. Three years later, he repeated the name in another letter to the Reverend Father Superior. Father Alouez lived at St. Francis Xavier Mission near Green Bay with the Menominee Indians, who knew something about the Mississippi. They spoke an Algonquin language that is similar to the language spoken by the Ojibwe, from whom we get the words Mississippi. 
It didn't take long for that name to reach Europe. In 1681, Estienne Michelet created a map in which he refers to the river as Mississippi or Grande Riviere. By the 1700s, Mississippi was the name most commonly used by cartographers. It's lucky for us that Mississippi survived, apart from challenging the spelling skills of all those grade school children like me. The name is poetic, and a Mark Twain book about life on the Immaculate Conception just wouldn't have the same ring. Nakata Indians, neighbors and sometimes rivals of the Ojibwe, had their own name for the river we call Mississippi, as did the many other Native American communities who lived along the river. I'll post some of those names in the show notes, show notes so you can check them out. I'm not going to try to embarrass myself by mispronouncing them all. While it is widely accepted that the word Mississippi is derived from the Ojibwe words for the river, there is an intriguing story from the southern end of the river involving the Choctaw Nation. In his 1899 book, History of the Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Natchez Indians, Horatio Cushman related a story about the moment when migrating Choctaw and Chickasaw Indians reached the Mississippi long before European contact. He wrote, After many months of wearisome travel, suddenly a vast body of flowing water stretched its mighty arm athwart their path. With unfeigned astonishment, they gathered in groups upon its banks and gazed upon its turbid waters. Never before had they even heard of, or in all their wandering stumbled upon, aught like this. Whence its origin? Where its terminus? This is surely the great father, the true source of all waters, whose age is wrapped in the silence of the unknown past, ages beyond all calculation, and as they are then and there, named it Misha Sipakani, beyond age, whose source and terminus are unknown. Kishman noted this story had been told to uh, missionaries as early as 1820, although probably with less of the romanticism that permeates Cushman's retelling of it. By 1820, Mississippi would have already been in wide use as the name of the river, and the myth-making was well underway. In 1928, Muriel Wright seized on Cushman's story, suggesting a linguistic connection between the name we use for the river today and those Choctaw words. She wrote, while it is generally accepted that Mississippi is an Indian word meaning father of waters, yet one seldom hears a discussion with reference to its real meaning, nor to which Indian language it belongs, there being more than 250 tribes or bands of Indians living in the United States, each having its own language or dialect. There was a story among the Choctaws who lived in the lower Mississippi country before the tribe came to Oklahoma that they and their kinsmen, the Chickasaws, migrated from a far western country long ago. When their leaders, the wise prophets of the two tribes, reached the great river in the band of the people, they contemplated its broad waters and exclaimed, Misha Sipakni. Misha in Choctaw means beyond, with the idea of far beyond, and Sipakni means age, conveying the idea of something ancient. Therefore, the words of the Choctaw and the Chickasaw prophets meant in substance, here is a river that is beyond all age. We have come to the most ancient rivers. As I've read various explanations of the meaning of Mississippi, I've occasionally come across someone who asserted that the word is derived from those Choctaw words, and they are usually referencing the work of Cushman and Wright when they do so. But we have a strong paper trail that shows the use of the, the name Mississippi in the early 17th century by French fur traders and missionaries who worked among the Ojibwe people, but there is no such record of the name Mississippi developing independently on the lower part of the river. It's true that in Dupratz's history of Louisiana, he translated Mississippi in a way that is consistent with the Choctaw words, but again, Mississippi was already widely accepted as the name for the river by then, which was 1758. Still, it's intriguing that two different American Indian nations used a similar-sounding phrase for, for what we now consider the same river, even if they mean something entirely different. The Mississippi has such a reputation now for its dark brown color that Big Muddy has become one of its nicknames. You may not be aware that there's an actual Big Muddy River in Illinois that lives up to its name, or that those of us who live around St. Louis, like me, insist that Big Muddy is North America's other big river, the Missouri. 
When author Christopher Morris, who lives in Texas, visited St. Louis a few years back to promote his book about the Mississippi, he took a little flack from folks around here for naming his book Big Muddy. Lewis and Clark would be on my side. When they explored the U.S.'s new territory in 1804 and 06, they drew much of their drinking water from, from the Missouri River. They commented that a single pint of water from the river yielded half a wine glass's worth of sludge. Now that's muddy. Most of that muck is run off from the eastern Rocky Mountains and the vast central plains of the U.S. Missouri donates that sediment to the Mississippi, which, re which relocated the dirt from the middle of North America to the end of the continent where it created Louisiana and parts of Mississippi and Arkansas. Big muddy to big mud. Even though the Missouri carries a heck of a lot less sediment than it once did thanks to the large dams on the upper Missouri, the Missouri still accounts for about 80% of the sediment load in the Mississippi River at St. Louis. In spite of the overwhelming evidence that the Missouri River is really big muddy, some people still need convincing. St. Louis has a big muddy dance company, after all, a big muddy blues festival that's held on the Mississippi River front, and a big muddy adventures that takes people canoeing on both muddy rivers. There's a movie called Big Muddy from 1998 that is set in Memphis, not Omaha, and the movie called Mud, while obviously set and shot on the Mississippi River, doesn't even mention the river's name once in the two-hour film. The Mississippi's reputation for muddiness really isn't fair. In 1712, Father Pierre Gabriel Marest, then living at Kaskaskia, Illinois, wrote in a letter, Seven leagues below the mouth of the Illinois River is found a large river called the Missouri, or more commonly, Pecatanui. That is to say, muddy water, which empties into the Mississippi on the west side. It is extremely rapid, and it discolors the beautiful water of the Mississippi. He wasn't alone in his perceptions. Uh, a century later, Charles Landman wrote, The moment that you pass the mouth of the Missouri on your way up the Father of Waters, you seem to be entering an entirely new world, whose every feature is beautiful exceedingly. The shores now slope with their green verdure to the very margin of the water, which is now of a deep green color, perfectly clear, and placid as the slumber of a babe. The brown water of today's upper Mississippi is a consequence of human activity. You can't blame the Mississippi for it. Along the upper portion of its length, the Mississippi runs clear until the Minnesota River dumps a heavy sediment load into it at Minneapolis, a consequence of deforestation along the river and modern row agriculture. It doesn't get any better as you head south from there through the heart of today's industrial agriculture belt. Still, that Missouri River is thicker and a darker cocoa than the Mississippi. At the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi Rivers 20 miles north of St. Louis, you can follow the mud trail of the Missouri for several miles downriver before the two rivers finally finish mixing their flows. That's why the Missouri is big muddy to us in St. Louis. It fouls our Mississippi. Or at least, it used to be more obvious about it. Maybe we can compromise. You can call the Mississippi River Big Muddy, but only south of its confluence with the Missouri River. Leave the northern part of the river out of it. We'll just pretend that we don't know what's going on in Burlington, Iowa, with the former Big Muddy Bar and Grill, and La Crosse, Wisconsin, which hosts the Big Muddy Run, or that you have to go north of the Twin Cities today to find a Mississippi that really is clear, like to, appropriately, Clearwater, Minnesota. And Big Muddy is obviously not the only nickname for the Mississippi. The Mississippi has also been known as the father of waters since at least the 18th century. The earliest known use of a phrase like father of waters appeared in Duprat's classic The History of Louisiana, published in 1763. Well, the English version anyway. The French version was published five years earlier. He wrote, The Mississippi divides this colony from north to south into two parts almost equal. The first discoverers of this river, by, way of, by the way of Canada, called it Colbert, in honor of that great minister. By some of the savages of the north, it is called Miak Chisippi, which literally denotes the ancient father of rivers, of which the French have, by corruption, formed Mississippi. In 1813, the phrase appeared in its familiar form in the weekly register, quote, The Mississippi is the Nile of America. The Aborigines who resided on its banks called it Mechasebi, or Father of Waters, a name which at once conveys to the mind an idea of the mighty flood and the simplicity of its description. 
President Abraham Lincoln also knew the nickname. After Grant had captured Vicksburg, Lincoln wrote in a letter to James Conklin, the father of waters again goes unvexed to the sea. Maybe Lincoln heard that phrase during one of his flatboat trips down the Mississippi River in 1828 or 1831. But let's go back to that story about the Choctaw phrase, Mississippi. A few years ago, I corresponded with uh, Jason Lewis from the Choctaw Tribal Language Program about it. He confirmed that the naming story related by Cushman is familiar to most Choctaw in Mississippi today. Assuming that the phrase was used by the Choctaw before Europeans arrived, it's possible that we carried the name Mississippi from the north, but merged it, or confused it, with the meaning of the Choctaw words. So instead of uh, a long river or river spread out over a wide area, we called it Father of Waters, which is basically what Duprats did. Other rivers around the world have similar nicknames. The Nile is sometimes called the Father of All Rivers, while Thais regard the Mekong River as the Mother of Waters. Quick side note, in 1861, Emily Marguerite Cowell called the Mississippi the Muddy Mother of Rivers. Not a bad name either. We tend to see big rivers in parental terms, but how we see our parents changes as we grow up, doesn't it? For many of us, we eventually cross a threshold where our father was no longer dad, but the old man, which isn't to be confused with my old man, which we reserve for a boyfriend or a husband. Maybe we've done something similar with the Mississippi. As, as we've grown up uh, as a country, our father of waters became old man river. The concept of the river as an old man isn't a recent phenomenon, as I mentioned, with the Choctaw phrase for the river meaning something like river beyond age and Dupat Duprat's translation of Mississippi's ancient father of rivers. Still, while there's an echo of old man river in those phrases, those that exact phrase apparently wasn't used until the 1920s when it appears in the song of the same name composed by Oscar Hammerstein and Jerome Kern. Not every nickname for the Mississippi is as ancient as its waters. Names are often whimsical, but what we call something matters. When Joliet tried to name the river Colbert, he wasn't just sucking up to his boss. He was also staking an ownership claim for the French colonial empire. He was trying to define who belonged on that river in the future, or who would control access to it anyway. Other names served similar roles. In the 20th century, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built a system of 29 locks and dams on the upper Mississippi. Lock number one is at Hastings, Minnesota, and the last lock, number 27, is at Granite City, Illinois. The dams impound water to create a minimum depth of nine feet or so, so big boats can travel the river consistently. The Corps calls the areas upstream of each dam a navigation pool, and numbers each one for the dams that created them. So, for example, the area upriver of lock number nine, but downriver of lock number eight is called Pool Nine. It's not uncommon for folks who live along the upper Mississippi to talk about where they live or fish by using these pool numbers. I caught some big walleyes in Pool 7 the other day, or from my house I can see Pool 12. Engineers gave us the language of pools, which, intentionally or not, redefines the river, changing it from a natural system to a human-controlled route for moving big boats. It tells us who is supposed to be there barges that carry bulk goods. It also advances an ideology that this river, the Mississippi, is something that exists for our convenience, to make over as we wish, to help us make a few extra bucks. Pools we can control, rivers we can't. One of the newest names for the Mississippi comes courtesy of the U.S. Department of Transportation, which was authorized by Congress to identify and name water routes that could be integrated with land transportation. Now, a cynic like me might look at this and think that this is just another attempt by highly subsidized shipping interests to secure more subsidies for a transportation system of dubious economic value, but maybe that's just me. The Department of Transportation designated the Mississippi from St. Paul to the Illinois River as M35, the waterway of the Saints. M55 runs from St. Louis to the Gulf of Mexico. You know, it's kind of got a ring to it. Imagine Mark Twain's revised book, Life on the M35, or the new cover version of an old Jimmy Rogers tune, Miss the M55 in You. It's enough to give me the M35 blues.
If you're enjoying the show, share that love with other people. Leave a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast app. Each review makes a difference and helps other fans of the Mississippi River and the Midwest find this show. We settled on the name Mississippi by the mid-18th century. We were still trying to define what the name applied to specifically, just where the river we called Mississippi began. This wasn't just an act of intellectual curiosity. At the end of the 18th century, border disputes between the U.S. and England couldn't be resolved without identifying the source of the Mississippi. In 1798, British surveyor David Thompson dipped into northern Minnesota to poke around for the Mississippi's source. Settling on Turtle Lake, which is north of today's Bemidji and about 40 miles from Lake Itasca, which we accept today as the source of the Mississippi. Zebulon Pike, who explored the upper reaches of the Mississippi in 1805-06, thought the river began at Leech Lake, which is about 34 miles east of Lake Itasca, although for some reason he also said that Red Cedar Lake, which we now call Cass Lake, was the upper source. The colorful Italian explorer Giacomo Beltrami slogged through the area in 1823, and he stated with great confidence that the Mississippi began at a place he called Lake Julia, which he also declared to be the source of the Red River of the North. Lake Julia is some 60 miles north of Lake Itasca. Beltrami, by the way, named uh, the lake for Julia de Medici, a close friend whose death in 1820 was uh, one of the reasons that compelled him to wander the world. In 1832, Henry Schoolcraft determined that Lake Itasca was the source of the Mississippi, thanks largely to the help from his Ojibwe guide, Ozawindib, who took him there. The Ojibwe called the lake Elk Lake. They already knew that it was a place where the river they called Mississippi began. Early French explorers had also visited the lake and adopted the same name, translating it into French as Lac La Biche. Trader William Morrison claimed to have visited the lake several times in the early 1800s when he worked as a trader in the area. So Schoolcraft wasn't the first Euro-American to visit the lake, and other people were already pretty sure that the lake was the source of the Mississippi. Maybe that's why Schoolcraft's visit was so quick and lacked any real scientific rigor. He trusted the information he got from talking with traders and Ojibwe Indians that the lake was the true source. He and his party zipped over to the lake during a military mission and did a quick look around, observing that the lake was in a bowl-shaped depression with no other streams coming or going. One of the members of the Schoolcraft expedition, Lieutenant James Allen, dutifully recorded this observation. He wrote, There can be no doubt that this is the true source and fountain of the longest and largest branch of the Mississippi. All our information that we had been able to collect on the way from traders and Indians pointed to it as such and our principal Indian guide, Ozawindib, who has proved to us his close intelligence of the country, represents the same. In fact, the whole country showed that there was no stream beyond, for the lake was shut in on all sides by pine hills, and the only opening through, through them was that by which it discharged itself. Schoolcraft, though, is credited as the discoverer of the source of the Mississippi. His prize, besides all that lasting fame, was christening the lake with a proper European-sounding name. With the help of William Bootwell, he coined the name Itasca by borrowing letters from two Latin words, veritas for truth and caput for head. He just fused the middle letters of that phrase together and chopped off the, early, the letters at the beginning of the end, and voila, we have Itasca. Since Schoolcraft's claim, there have been periodic disputes about whether Lake Itasca is indeed the true source of the Mississippi. Some hydrologists consider the, the real source to be Hernando de Soto Lake because it has an underground aquifer that connects to Lake Itasca, while others insist that Nicollet Creek is really the beginning of the Mississippi. They could all be right, even Beltrami. Defining the source of a river, especially a big one, is, a dif is difficult, and there's no single widely accepted method. Two definitions have been common, the most distant point upstream that carries the most water, and the farthest point upstream on the longest tributary. Neither definition works perfectly. As for the former, the volume of water in a river, in a river varies throughout the year, 
So someone would have to measure river volumes many times a year for several years to get a reliable average, and who really wants to do that? The latter definition isn't much better. When Euro-Americans ran around assigning their own names to rivers, they didn't always know how long each river's tributary was. Besides that, rivers are dynamic and often cut new channels through meanders. A river that measured up today might not be the headwater stream tomorrow after it shaves a few miles off its length. Modern hydrologists take a somewhat different approach. They categorize rivers based on the, its number of branches using a system proposed by author Arthur Strayler in 1952, and for some reason it's called the Strayler Stream Number. A first order stream has no tributaries. A second order stream is created when two single order streams merge and so on. In this system, first through third order streams could be considered headwater streams, and a stream doesn't become a river until it reaches the seventh order when two sixth order streams merge. I'm being a little loose with using streams and rivers, but you get the point. It's about uh, how big they get. Based strictly on stream order, the Mississippi officially becomes a river just north of Minneapolis, where it merges with the Crow River. By the time it, meets, by the time it reaches the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi is a 10th order river. The Amazon, by the way, tops out as a 12th order river, which is the highest for any river on the planet. This system basically dodges the issue of defining a wellspring by acknowledging that a river grows from multiple sources, all those lower order streams. A river may therefore have headwaters, but it doesn't start from a single source. If you tried to mark the Mississippi headwaters based on the Strayler system, you'd have to put up a sign at the beginning of each of the hundreds of first through third order streams that feed the Mississippi, which would obviously take a lot of signs. The scientists just don't make good publicists. All of this is really just an academic exercise, though. The river we call Mississippi is just one part of a series of connected streams and rivers. We gave it a single name because it makes our lives easier when we impose some order on the world. We've tried to define a set of rules for determining a river source or headwaters, but, you know, as human beings, we're just not that good at agreeing to a common set of rules, much less following them. So, if you think you have a better way to define what we mean by the source of a river, feel free to propose it. I'm sure plenty of us would adopt it, uh, and many more would be happy to tell you why it's a terrible idea. In spite of our inability to agree at a common definition for the source of the river, we somehow managed to agree to use the name Mississippi for the river that bisects the U.S. How did a name used by the Ojibwe Indians come to be the one used for the whole river, one that stretches from the vast and frigid pine forests of the north all the way to the warm coastal marshes 2,000 miles downstream, passing through territory where many other Native American nations lived, each of which had their own name for that same river? Why did Mississippi survive when Nitonks, the Quapaw word, or Wakpatanka, uh, the Dakota word, or some variant of those didn't? Well, we named the Mississippi backwards. The name Mississippi prevailed in large part because the people who made the maps explored the river mostly from north to south. In 1820, Henry Roll Schoolcraft was part of the Lewis Cass expedition in northern Minnesota as they explored the area on what is now Cass Lake, what the Ojibwe called Red Cedar Lake. Schoolcraft recorded this observation about one of the streams that entered the lake. He wrote, This branch is considered the largest inlet and preserves, in the language of the voyagers, the name of the Mississippi. Schoolcraft knew about the tradition among the voyagers to call that stream Mississippi and continued using that same name. The word Mississippi comes from the Ojibwe people, who were key trading partners with those early voyagers. These are the people who learned the Ojibwe language and place names, many of which were then recorded by the missionaries, the literate ones among those early Europeans. Those place names then reached the Europeans who were making the first maps of North America. Those early French explorers and missionaries spent most of their time in the northern reaches of the Mississippi Basin. In 1683, Father Louis Hennepin published a booklet, it was a big hit, about his travels around the upper Mississippi. 
The book included a map that showed a solid line for the Mississippi, what he called Colbert at that time, that extended from Canada to roughly the Arkansas River. Below that point, a dotted line to the Gulf of Mexico represented the unknown region where the river ended. Those early French missionaries and voyagers didn't know much about the southern end of the river because they first encountered the upper part of the river and explored it by traveling south with the current. They picked up the name Mississippi from the indigenous people who lived in the north, the Ojibwe Indians, and carried that name with them as they floated downstream. They didn't follow any rigid set of rules about which branch carried more volume or was, or was longer. They just applied the name to the body of water as they traveled it. And it stuck. It's really just an accident of history that the river we know today as the Mississippi carries that name for the length it does. If those early Europeans had explored the Mississippi from its mouth and traveled upriver, the map of North American rivers would look very different today. Every time explorers reached a confluence of sizable rivers, they would have had to decide which branch was the main stem and would therefore carry the name of the river they were on. They might have made their decision based on the volume of water or length of its branches, or maybe they would have just picked the one that looked just right. The north from the Gulf, the Ohio is shorter than the Mississippi by over 300 miles, but it carries a lot more water, nearly 50% more uh, most of the time. And if you look down at the Mississippi-Ohio confluence from Fort Jefferson Hill at Wycliffe, Kentucky, it sure looks like the Ohio River is the one that continues south, with the Mississippi smacking into the Ohio at a steep angle. Continuing further north, the Missouri is longer than the Mississippi, drains an area more than three times the size of the upper Mississippi, and usually carries more water too, at least it did before it was constrained by the dams we built in the 20th century. At the place that the Dakota Indians called Bedote, the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers, the Mississippi is the longer of the two, but they each carry about the same volume of water. But if you look closely at the characteristics of the two river valleys, as geologist Wendell Duffield argued in 2012, there's better geologic continuity from the Minnesota River Valley down through the Mississippi Valley, which is really no surprise. The valleys below Minneapolis were carved by the same glacial meltwaters flowing out of glacial Lake Agassiz down a super river we've called Warren. If these conventions had all been followed, the names of North American rivers could look very different today. Look at the show notes for a map that I put together that shows my fanciful take on how the rivers uh, might look today if we'd followed some of these rules or explored from the south. Uh, but for the, I'm going to describe it a little bit, and uh, for, uh, for the sake of argument, I'm going to assume that the name Minnesota would carry south from Bedote, then Missouri would be the name of the river at the next confluence, and it would carry to the Ohio, except I'm giving the Ohio a different name. I'm calling it the Batson River. I took the Caddo Indian words for the river, which are something like Pahat Sasin, and anglicized them as we certainly would have done. So if all these names had been used, Mark Twain's Minnesota River would have ended north of St. Louis, which would have been the great city on the Missouri River. New Orleans would be uh, the rowdy city on the Batson River. Lake Itasca would probably still be Elk Lake, the outlet for a stream called Mississippi that ended at Minneapolis. The Minnesota River would not have inspired a grand search for its headwaters. It's in South Dakota, if you want to go there. Schoolcraft and Pike would have had to find other expeditions to make them famous. There would be no epic canoe trips on the Mississippi River. Maybe young and old adventurers and stand-up paddleboarders would challenge themselves with a 2,250-mile trip down the middle of the continent on the Minnesota-Missouri-Batson River complex to the sea. Or maybe they'd challenge themselves with a 3,490-mile trip from the Rockies down the length of the Missouri and Batson Rivers to the Gulf of Mexico. There'd be no great river, just a couple of pretty good ones. Paul Robeson would not have sung Old Man River. The Big Muddy would run through the great interior of North America, and the father of waters would just be some beverage company's name on a plastic bottle. The great mythology of the river we know today as the Mississippi would have, spit, would have spread out among several rivers, none of them named Mississippi, and I wouldn't be doing a podcast about a river. In The Boy and the River, without beginning or end, 
T.S. Eliot wondered, at what point in its course does the Mississippi become what the Mississippi means? The Mississippi means many things to many people, but only because the name Mississippi flows from Minnesota to the Gulf, through the heart of the U.S. It became what the Mississippi means when those early French explorers carried the name from the indigenous peoples of the, of the North down to the Gulf of Mexico and back to Europe, so generations of mapmakers would continue to pass it on to the rest of us. At what point does the Mississippi become what the Mississippi means? I'd say around 1667. And now it's time for the Mississippi Minute. Today, coming to you from uh, near Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at Waddle Wildlife Refuge, which I'm sure is not the, na the way anybody around here will pronounce it. I'm just uh, out for a quick hike to check this area out. The Comite River flows through just up ahead. I kind of want to walk down there and uh, and see what it looks like and uh, what some of the vegetation around here is like, especially right now with things so dry. One of the things that uh, I'm really appreciating is uh, I've only recently, here in the past year, year and a half, gotten to uh, gotten to know, gotten familiar with some geo-referenced apps that help me when I'm hiking around. So I'm using an app called Avenza today. I can uh, uh, import a PDF that's geo-referenced. And as I'm hiking around, I can pull up my app, and even if I don't have cell service, but I have my GPS service turned on, the map, uh, points on the map show me exactly where I am as I'm walking around. Normally, like, I like to think I'm kind of a typical guy, and, you know, I don't like to ask for directions, I'm capable of finding my own way around, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the truth is, sometimes I get lost out here <laughs> hiking around, uh, and there's... More than once, the, this geo-referenced map uh, has bailed me out and found, helped me figure out where I was and, and how to get back to my car. So uh, I think they're very handy. In the future, I may tell you about some other apps that I also am enjoying quite a bit these days. But right now, as I walk around, I'm grateful for the Avenza app and the geo-referenced maps. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to the series on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. I offer the podcast for free, but when you support the show with a few bucks through Patreon, you help keep the program going. Just go to patreon.com slash Dean Klinkenberg. If you want to know more about the Mississippi River, check out my books. I write the Mississippi Valley Traveler guidebooks for people who want to get to know the Mississippi better. I also write the Frank Dodge Mystery Series that's set in places along the river. Find them wherever books are sold. The Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast is written and produced by me, Dean Klinkenberg. Original music by No Offense. See you next time. <laughs>